Let's see. Turn your Bible, please, back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Did you know this? If, if everybody will come back tonight, I'm going to have an eight foot screen, and we're going to have the Super Bowl playing at six o'clock. So I invite everybody to come back, bring your friends, bring your, bring your entertainment now, and your drinks and everything, and we'll have a good time here in the house of the Lord watching the Super Bowl. Did you know that there are some churches doing exactly that? I was, as some people was telling me about it. They're going to have a Super Bowl party at churches. I can't imagine. Did you know there'd be more money bet during that Super Bowl time? And, and you can even imagine. I was listening to some of them talking about it yesterday on TV. They said they'll even bet on the guy that's announcing what color tie he's going to be wearing. <laughs> And just anything they can bet on, they'll be betting on it. And isn't it strange to you that they're going to start at 6 o'clock, right at church time? Don't you think the devil knows what he's doing? I uh, started Wednesday night, and then again uh, this morning our Sunday school, talking about this thing of Jesus coming back soon. And I believe he is. Now, I do believe this that the Bible has says in a verse of scripture I can't think what the verse is right now it says when you hear the thunder and rolling you know that there's a storm coming and what it's talking about there is that the second coming of Christ we don't have to go into the second coming of Christ blind we know that there is things leading up to it alright there is a time coming like this world has never known before. And that's a great tribulation period. Now the question that a lot of people are asking and teaching in churches today is, uh, will a believer go into the tribulation period? If you're saved by God's grace, are you going to go through that seven years of the horrible wrath of God being poured out on this world and on mankind. I want to answer that for you in the Word of God. Now, I'm not talking about what I believe because I, I love to go through the Scriptures and find something, a doctrine or truth that somebody asked me and go through the Scriptures and back up what I believe. I don't, I don't find something that I believe and then try to miss prove it by the word of God I want to prove I want to know what thus saith the Lord about anything that I doctrinally believe and I want God to see it and that's what I want him to do for us today now if you're saved today you're a child of God don't forget that as we go through it right now somebody said I'll be glad when I get to heaven I'll be saved no if you're not saved now you're not going to heaven you get saved here on this earth. You become a child of God on this earth. Sometimes we don't like, act like it, but you got to remember something. We're sinners saved by the grace of God. Even in the book of 1 Peter, I believe it's 1 Peter, it might be 2 Peter, he said that you can backslide, a child of God can get away from the Lord so far that you'll forget that you would ever purge from your sins. Think about that for just a minute. So we know that we're sinners saved by the grace of God. Only by the grace of God do we stay close to the Lord. And He encourages us all the time. Stay close to the Lord. Uh, stay prayed up. Listen to the Bible. Read the Bible. Pray. Stay close to the Lord. If you don't, then the devil will trick you into believing a lie. Now, I want to read something to you. I want you to listen very carefully. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, beginning in verse 1, but of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For yourself know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that they... they should overtake you as a thief. You are the children of light 
and the children of the day. We're not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for the helmet the hope of salvation. For God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also we do. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, we ask you that the Holy Spirit might open our minds and our hearts, give us some wisdom to understand thy word today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you go to go to Second Peter for just a minute, I'd like to read some verses there to you. In First Peter chapter three, and I want to begin to read in verse four. And saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water, and in the water, whereby the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now, by the same word against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, the earth also, and the works that are therein shall be burned up, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought we to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hastening unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we are according to his promise, look for a new heaven and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. Now, in Second Peter chapter 3, verse 4, talks about a time coming when we will say, where is the promise of his coming? Let me say it like this. I've been saved ever since I was 26 years old. I'm 85 now. I can't, I can't figure out how many years. It's been a long time I've been saved. I've been sitting under preachers uh, that preach the gospel. And I've heard preachers all, ever since I've been saved talking about Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. Jesus could come any moment. Well, he ain't come yet. And that makes a lot of people, like First Second Peter says, that some will say, where is his coming? He ain't come yet. But I got news for you. One day of the Lord is a thousand years. Think about that for just a minute. God's no hurry. God's working on a timetable. But he is coming. And he said he was. Now, right there, there's going, people are going to say then that... that Teachers will be teachers of doctrinal truths that are not scriptural then. We're in that day. Now there are preachers and teachers standing in churches and teaching and preaching that Christians will go into the tribulation period. Now you must remember this. God's word will never contradict itself. If God's word teaches something in the New Testament, then God uh, backs it up in type and in figure in the Old Testament. First of all, how does anyone get saved? Now you think with me a minute. I'm talking about anybody. All the way back to Adam. How does anyone get saved? Or made ready to go to heaven? Let me say this. You are not going to God's heaven until you are made ready. 
You cannot go there until God makes you ready. Now, get this, please. All of us are going to die if Jesus don't come back soon. All through the Bible, there's a red ribbon of blood that runs through it. Adam and Eve, after they had sinned, was clothed by an animal, uh, uh, innocent animal skin, meaning blood had to be shed before they could be clothed in God's righteousness. Abel offered a blood sacrifice. God told the children of Israel, when I see the blood on the two side posts and the lintel, I will pass over you. As death angel came, called him, and on and on it goes all the way through the Bible. The blood is all the way through the Old Testament. Then Jesus came, and the Bible said he's a Lamb of God, sacrificed for the sins of the whole world. John 3.16. That's blood shedding. Jesus shed his blood upon the cross for the forgiveness of all mankind. So if you are covered by the blood of Jesus Christ to wash your sins away, you are a child of God. Now I said all that to say this. Do you know I'm a child of God today? You're a child of God today if you're saved by the grace of God. Now brother, that's a great thing to know. God is your heavenly father. All fathers want the best for their children. God sure wants the best for his children then. Romans 5 verse 8. Seeing, being more now justified by his blood, that is Christ's blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. 1 Thessalonians 5 9. For God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. God said, down through the life, he laid down his life for us sinners. John 15, verse 13. Greater love had no man than this, than a man laid down his life for his friends. Jesus did that for you and I. Over and over in the Bible, you find similar words as this. God so loved. God cares for you. God cares for his own. Now, knowing all of that, God came into this world to save you and I from sin, from hell, and the grave, he said. He's going to take you to heaven if you believe in him. Then, do you believe such a God is that as a heavenly father would dare carry his children through the most horrible days in human history, the tribulation period? Now, if you read the book of Revelation, brother, and, and other portions of Scripture, you'll find that there's a seven-year period of time coming in the history of mankind. It's the most horrible period of time that's ever existed, ever will exist on the face of this earth. Now, God gives us examples of how he takes care of his own during times of tribulation. For instance, Noah's Ark. Now, we all know the story of Noah's Ark. God told Noah to preach for 120 years. And he preached, uh, warning, rapture's coming. Warning, God is coming. Warning, God's wrath is fixing to fall upon the face of the earth. He warned people to get in the ark. God's type of salvation, lifting up out of that water. There's a great storm coming. Water's coming. This world's going to perish one of these days. And he preached that for 120 years. And then God told Noah and his family that he was going to destroy the earth by water. The flood, that was the flood. God told Noah to build the ark. The God told, then God told Noah to get in the ark. And then the Bible said that God closed the door of the ark on Noah and his family. And not one drop of water ever fell on Noah. Why? Because he was in the ark. That's the wrath of God. Not one ounce of the wrath of God fell on his family. That's type and figure of the rapture and going through the tribulation period. Now, again, going through the, talking about types and figures, First Peter called Lot a just man. You know what a just man is? That's a saved man. 
Now we know Lot was a was a child of God, but we also know he was backslidden. God told Abraham he was going to destroy the city that Lot lived in, in Sodom and Gomorrah, with fire and brimstone. That's tribulation. Angels went and told Lot, get out of this place before they could destroy it. And the Bible says these angels said to Lot, listen to this, I can do nothing until you're out of there. No wrath of God fell on Lot. So we know by type and figure, no wrath of God can fall on the child of God then. As some says, the New, so says the New Testament. Now watch it. Where the confusion comes in is, is when Jesus, his disciples, asked Jesus for a sign of when he was coming back. Now turn with me to Matthew chapter 24 a minute. Matthew chapter 24. I want to stay there a little while, so just keep your finger in Matthew chapter 24. Now the confusion comes is, is when his disciples came and asked Jesus, give us a sign of when you're coming back. But the church, listen now, the church, saved people, don't live by signs. We don't live by wonders. The Bible said we're a by faith people. We're saved by the faith of God, not by signs. Let me tell you something. I want you to listen to me very carefully. I don't need for water to be turned into wine. I don't need to water to be turned into blood. I don't need for a stick to turn into a serpent to know there's a live God. You know why? I got the Bible. The Bible tells us he did. Amen. He tells us he's God. He tells us that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So I don't need a sign. The book of Matthew all the way through, God is telling the Jewish nation, which is a sign people, the Jewish, uh, Jewish nation, look for a sign. Show me a sign that you're coming back. And the book of Matthew chapter 24 is filled with signs reaching up to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now watch this. Jesus even prayed in Matthew chapter, I mean John chapter 17 for you and I. And Jesus prayed in John 17, Lord, keep those that I give you, that you give me. And Jesus promised in John chapter 10, in verse 29, and so on, as many as my Father gives me, no man can pluck them out of my hand. You know what that is? That's protection. God promised to take care of his children. Signs and wonders are for the Jewish nation. And remember Noah, I mean Moses and Aaron, as they come before Pharaoh, and Pharaoh, a type of the world, said, show me a sign that you're from God. And they did all those signs and wonders before him to prove there was a child, that there was a God. But a child of God doesn't have to live in darkness. We have the wisdom of the Holy Spirit in us. Listen now. When I got saved, the Holy Spirit, according to 1 Corinthians, came into my body and your body, and He lives within us. Now, I don't understand that. I can't fathom that, but I know it's true. You know why? Because God said it's true. Amen? So I know something lives in me that didn't live used to be there. Because I used to could do things, it didn't bother me one ounce. Since I got saved, everything I do wrong bothers me. And the Bible says that I have the witness of the Holy Spirit in me. All right? So every child of God now has a witness of the Holy Spirit in us. A child of God doesn't have to live in darkness then. We have the wisdom of the Holy Spirit in us. God said when you hear it thundering, the rain is coming, there's a storm are coming. So we can read and study Matthew 24 and know these things are coming during the tribulation period. And Christians living uh, near this terrible day can see and understand Jesus is about to come. For instance, Peter spoke of false teachers. That's happening today. We have false teachers. He also spoke of the church growing cold and witnessed the Lord Jesus Christ for souls to be saved. He said that was going to uh, come in a day that would be cold. I never thought that I would see in my lifetime people just stop going to church. 
Now, I know you can blame it on the COVID. You can blame it on some kind of disease. When the devil gets through that, he'll throw in another one. He'll get some, he'll cause you for some reason or another to quit going to church. And I want you to know that the Bible says that time was coming. Well, it's here. Amen? So that means it's drawing nigh. The Bible tells us nation will be against nation. That's true today. More than it's ever been in my lifetime. Race will be against race. That's true today. Every race you tell you, all you can hear about on TV today in the news is the blacks against the white and the whites against the white. And they, they, now they put in the, the uh, Mexicans, uh, what do you call it, Spanish people being mistreated and everybody's being mistreated. Well, I got news for you. Who told you life is going to be easy? Amen? And we got to understand the race is going to be against race. The Bible says so. So that's happening today. Families will turn on families. The Bible says that mother be against daughter, daughter against mother, son against so on, all the way. The Bible says that's going to happen. That's true today. That's true today. Now watch this. Food will become scarce. Famine will begin to take place. I'm going to tell you the truth. Anybody that will go to the grocery store today and look at what happened in the last few months, think about it. This has only happened in less than a year. In less than a year, it's one from a, a America being a, a nation of a plenty. I mean, you could go in the grocery store and the store shelves are full. I went yesterday to the grocery store and I was looking at the shelves that are empty. It's always the thing I want. <laughs> you know, but they're empty. And you know what Biden said the other day? He said, learn to live with less. Well, then get your little maid out of your house and quit driving your limousine and quit flying your airplane and learn to ride a bicycle, Biden. Right. Amen. Amen? Now, what I'm saying, though, that's scriptural. That's scriptural. There's a famine coming. Now, watch this. That's before the tribulation period. We can see it coming. It's getting ready for its coming. We can know the time for Jesus to come back is drawing nigh. The Bible says no man can know the exact time. The only God knows the exact time himself. No angel, no principality, nobody, a wizard or nobody else can tell you exactly when Jesus is coming. Now, what are we to do? Number one, we are to watch and pray even so come Lord Jesus. We are to be winning souls for Christ. We are to be strengthening each other in the face or encouraging each other in the Lord. Now remember, Jesus is coming back for his church as a thief in the night. Now that's the rapture. Now you better be ready and waiting for him. Then seven years later, Jesus is coming back with his church. Now, the confusion is that people don't understand there's two phases of Jesus' coming. Jesus is coming, first of all, for his church. The rapture is talking about, and by the way, the word rapture is not in the Bible. It simply means caught up. That's what the word rapture means. And you'll find that in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We're to be caught up, raptured. Now, when, you, when we're raptured, a child of God, that's the first phase. We go to the judgment seat of Christ at that time. Then the tribulation period begins. And then we come in back with him to this area. And then the Bible said that every eye shall see him at that time. But right now, can you imagine this? What if he was married to an unsaved wife? Or an unsaved husband. And you were saved. You're a child of God. And one morning you get up and they're gone. And I'm not talking about a divorce. I'm talking about the off face of the earth. They're gone. No trace of them. And the devil said he will send you at that time strong delusion and you will believe a lie. You know what that means? They get on TV and tell you a Martian came through the other day and took a bunch of people. And the Bible says that everybody will believe that. Amen? You know, I was talking to somebody the other day. They don't even believe that a man went to the moon. 
Isn't that crazy? But people believe that kind of stuff. Why? Because the devil, the Bible says the devil will strain you strong delusion. But you got to remember, says, when the rapture takes place, I'm a child of God and I'm going. Amen? Amen. And those dead in Christ are going to rise first and then we're going to go up to meet with the Lord and we're going to be at the judgment seat of Christ at that time and we're going to be judged according to our works and God's going to give out rewards to those that f serve Him faithfully. Not for salvation's sake. You're saved before you ever get there. He's going to give you out rewards that you can lay at His feet one day. Now watch this. Then... During that time, this tribulation period is going to go on this earth. Great wrath of God is going to be poured out. And the Bible has a lot to say about that, but I don't want to go into that. I just want to show you it's going to take place. Then at the rapture, the church, seven years later, Jesus comes with his church, and every eye shall see him, and at his coming back with him. Now, when we do that, then there's a great white throne judgment set up, and God's going to judge the unsaved, and they're going to get the, degree, the degrees of punishment in hell. So don't get confused. When you're reading Matthew chapter 24, listen to what it says in verse 37. But as in the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. That tells us that people is going to go about just before Jesus comes back for his church. We're going to be eating and drinking just like, you know what that means? That's everyday living. People get married every day. People eat all the time. That doesn't mean a great new thing's going to take place. That just means everybody's going to be going about doing their own thing. Just everyday living. And then Jesus comes. And the Bible says he's coming back at a flash. There'll be no time. Somebody says, I'll get saved when Jesus comes back. No, you won't. You won't have time. Because the Bible says he's coming back as a blinking of an eye. You don't have time to do anything then. And you'll go up to be the Lord. Man, I'm looking for that great day. Amen? Amen. And you know something else? I'm looking back coming with him. That's at the end of the tribulation. When it's all said and done, you're, we're coming back with him. You know what all that's about? I say this a great deal, and, and it's so true. Did you know I'm a, I'm a trophy of God's grace? It's only by the grace of God that I got saved at all. Man, I didn't want God in my life. I didn't want nothing to do with the Lord Jesus. I didn't want nothing to do with His Bible. I sure didn't want them crazy preachers preaching all the time. I'm not going to hear that mess. And one day I went to hear a preacher preach. And by the grace of God, he got a hold of my heart strings and brought me to the Lord Jesus Christ. I fell on my knees and asked the Lord to save me. That's by the grace of God. If I, if I got my right deserved, I'd have, got, I'd, have, I'd have went to hell. But by the grace of God, he saved my soul. And I think about this a great deal. By the grace of God, he keeps me. And he loves me. And I'm one of his children. And he wants the best for me. I get so tired of poor mouthing Christians. I really do. And I say like uh, they don't like a little old poem I had about a sparrow. He said they must not have a heavenly father like the little sparrow does. The little sparrow gets fed and took care of by God. Brother, I do too. Every day of my life, God feeds and takes care of me through this life. I don't understand why God's given me the life, the long life he had, but I thank God for it by the grace of God. And that tells me one thing. God loves me. And he loves you too. He don't want you to go to hell. He don't want you to go through that great time. He don't want you to end up burning in a lake of fire forever and ever. But he's got to put you there if you stomp in his, blood, his son's blood and deny him as your Savior. And I don't want nobody to go there. 
And all the time I warn people ever since God called me to preach, I've been warning them, there is a time coming and you won't have time to make up your mind after that. I had a good friend of mine years ago. He called me. He said, Brother Strong, you go see my brother. He's not saved and he's dying. And I went to see him and I sat on their couch and I talked with him a while. I said, has anybody ever took the Bible and showed you how you could know to go to heaven? No, sir. I said, will you allow me to right now? And he said, I, I wish you would because he knew he was sick. He knew he didn't have long. Nobody knew how short it was, but he knew he didn't have long. He had cancer. He was eat up with it and he knew he was very sick. And just a few minutes on that couch, I give him the scriptures. I showed him how God loved him, how God didn't want him to go to hell, that God wanted to save his soul, and he prayed and asked the Lord to save him. I left there that day rejoicing that he gotten saved, but he died that night. You know what, folks? I guarantee you, if you'd asked him while he's sitting there on that couch, you believe you're going to die tonight? No. I don't believe I'm going to die tonight. Do you know how many people are going through this world thinking the same thing? It's not going to happen to me. Do you know how many wrecks happen in Tampa in a week's time? Well, it's not going to happen to me. Well, you ain't rode with Barry. <laughs> Amen. I, I was driving my wife the other day coming down Highway 60. I said, you know what? You don't know what kind of fools out there coming towards you. They run across the medium, run head on to you. What can you do about it? Nothing. You don't know where it's at. You don't know where you're going to meet it. But I do know one thing. If I'm alive, when Jesus comes, he's coming for me. And I'm going to go be with him. And he has promised me that he will come. And he loves me. And he wants to protect me. But I wouldn't be in the devil's crowd shoes. Brother, when I read what's going to happen to them, and the Bible said they'll even get to the place that they'll call for the mountains to fall upon them because they can't stand it anymore. But they cannot die because the wrath of God is falling upon them. You think about that. That's why it's so important. And I beg people, I plead with people, come to Jesus now because I honestly believe He could come today. And can you imagine this? I was talking to Ronnie and he said he's with his brother when he died. And I said the same thing when Brother McCracken died. I was by his bedside. I said, can you imagine what he just saw when he took his last breath? To have somebody present with the Lord and all the glory of God he got to see. And I beg people all the time, don't you want to go to heaven with me? That's what the rapture is all about. And that's what the tribulation period is all about. To teach us, just like in Noah's day, for 120 years, people watched him. What's that crazy old man doing? He got bored. He cut the trees down. He, he measured the boards. He got them all just right. He worked for 120 years building that ark and getting it ready. And everybody, he got bigger and bigger. What in the world is he doing? And he warned people, there's a storm coming. The wrath of God is coming. They hadn't seen rain. No rain's coming. There ain't nothing going to happen to us. And can you imagine when God shut the door? And all those people outside, and the first drop of rain, it fell. They began to scream and holler, let me in, let me in. Too late. And you know why? Because God shut the door. And you're not going to open what God shuts. Amen? Stand with me, please. Heavenly Father, I pray in Jesus' name that you'll help everybody that's listening or li here today understand something. The devil's greatest tool is procrastination. That is, putting off salvation. Putting off coming to Christ, thinking that we got plenty of time. There's no hurry. Jesus ain't come back for all these years. He ain't coming back today. He might not even come back tomorrow. 
But Father, I know this. You promised you would come. And you could come any moment at the twinkle of an eye. And Lord, I am so glad I made that decision for you years and years ago. And I pray for somebody that's listening today that they'll make that decision right now. All they have to do is come to you by faith and pray the old sinner's prayer. Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. I believe you're my Savior. And I'll trust your shed blood for the forgiveness of my sin. I pray somebody will pray that and mean it in their heart today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.